Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we'll be watching Kusro and Ishirawan, Part 2, Prince of Persia by Extra History. So, this is the second episode in our series on Kusro. In Part 1, we actually didn't see much of Kusro because it was about his father, Kavad. We saw Kavad's early life and the beginning of his very volatile reign as the Shah of Iran. I'm excited to continue that journey, and hopefully today we will see more of Kusro. Now, if you guys end up enjoying this video, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or channel memberships for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. Following his father's death, Kavad had staved off disaster time and again for the Empire, but yearly peace tributes to the Heftalites had left the Iranian treasury bare. Yes, so Kavad has had a very volatile rule, uh, and as we talked about last time, he was kidnapped by the Hephthalites as a young child. The Hephthalites were sort of the rivals of the Sassanid Empire. He was kept as a prisoner, but he was treated pretty well. He was brought up by them, and they helped him regain his throne. And so what we've seen is every time Kavad needs help, or he needs to regain his throne, he goes back to the Hephthalites, asks for help, and gives them a ton of money. The Sassanids have been paying a lot of tribute to the Hephthalites, which has staved off a war, because the Sassanids had lost a couple of wars to the Hephthalites, but now they're going broke trying to pay off this tribute, so something's gonna have to change. Nothing was left to help the farmers who fed the empire. Without help, Kavad's people would soon starve. In desperation, mm. he turned to his neighbors, the Eastern Roman Empire. Wow, how about that? We're finally getting the Romans involved. Um, that always excites me a little bit because, as I mentioned many times, I know a lot more about the Byzantines than I do the Sassanids. That's sort of my point of reference in all of this. Um, of course, the Sassanids are longtime rivals with the Byzantines, it goes even deeper than that. I mean, it's really the Romans and the Persians. They are probably each other's biggest rivals. Uh, and so, you know, it's pretty interesting to see the Sassanids turn to the Romans. But it is something that they would do time, time to time if they had a bigger threat to confront, which in this case they do, the Hephthalites. Despite countless generations of conflict between Rome and Iran, the mm. two empires had been at peace for nearly a century. Nomadic mm. tribes across the Caucasus Mountains to the north had forced them to agree on terms of mutual defense. And, and this is exactly how it works. They are eternal rivals, basically. <laughs> They've been rivals as long as both of them have been around. But, as I mentioned, that rivalry is only sort of active as long as they don't have other threats to deal with. If both empires have other enemies, whether it be nomadic tribes or the Sassanids dealing with the Hephthalites or whatever, then they sort of have to put the rivalry on hold, sign a truce for however many years. Uh, in this case, it's been, you know, a century, a long time, and deal with their other problems. And then eventually they get back to fighting each other. <laughs> Iran would guard the pass through the mountains, called the Caucasian Gates, so long as Rome sent money to help pay the soldiers. Mm. But the Romans had gotten kind of distracted. They were all like, we're kind of dealing with these other wars in the north right now, <laughs> and also in the west, and wait. Ah, oh, crap, the Ostrogoths just took Rome. Like, actual yep. Rome. Oh, jeez. Can you guys handle the northern tribes thing while we... T hey, you guys give that back, I'm not kidding. So... I mean, look, both the Sassanids and the Romans held incredible amounts of lands, they had incredibly large empires, which meant they both had a lot of things going on at the same time. I think particularly the Romans, or at least the Romans are who I know more about, they seemingly always had threats at basically every border that they had to deal with, uh, perpetual crises, particularly at this point, so it does make sense that they'd get a little distracted. So Rome had stopped paying for the northern defense. And since Iran had their own problems at the time, multiple wars with the Hephthalites and their king dying, followed yep. by a decade of political turmoil, they weren't exactly in a position to press the issue. But now, now that Kavad had finally pulled his empire back together, now it was time to press. Mm. Kavad reached out to the Roman emperor, Anastasius, and insisted that Rome pay its share. 
That would take some of the strain off of Iran's treasury, so Kavad could subsidize his farmers and avoid a famine. But Anastasius replied, saying, Well, we never technically signed an agreement <laughs> or anything, so we're not going to pay you back. But hey, we of can course. give you a loan. To which Kavad responded, I'll loan my fist to your face and went to war. <laughs> Now, waging war is generally not a good idea for empires on the brink of ruin, but Kavad really needed this one. Raiding... F I mean, look, if you're already verging on broke, the treasury is empty, waging war can be a pretty good way to make the problem even worse. It's expensive to wage a war. Now it can be worth it if you manage to accrue more supplies in that war, or in this case, they want the Romans to pay for their defense against these nomadic raiders, but it is kind of a big risk. Food and supplies from the border cities of the Roman Empire solved his immediate problem of feeding his own empire, and it also solved his long-term problem of getting the Hephthalites off his back. As Iran's eastern neighbors, the Hephthalites very much enjoyed watching Iran go to war with mm -hmm. the West. They liked it so much that they- Well, and I'm sure Rome liked watching Iran go to war in the east. I mean, it's really the same calculus for all of these political players involved, all of these states. You know, they're all rivals with, you, with each other, and if your rival is busy with their other rival, well, that gives you an opportunity to attack, or maybe to shore up your borders, or maybe it gives you opportunity to have peace for a little bit, um, and have some prosperity. So, you know, it's the same idea. They sent their own soldiers to join in the looting, <laughs> which was actually pretty handy because the Hephthalites had wiped out the core of Iran's army ten years ago. This war lasted only a few years, but it ended with Rome finally agreeing to pay tribute to Iran. Mm. Kabad had adopted the superior swords and bows of his Hephthalite allies and ah. built his broken army back into a power to be feared. Okay, and hey, that's pretty smart. You know, we saw last time the Sassanids get defeated by the Hephthalites several times. Seems like the Hephthalites definitely were the superior military force. And so if you're faced with that situation, the smart thing to do, which it seems Kavad has done, is take some notes, right? Learn lessons from your enemy. What are they doing better? Do they have better weapons, better organization, better strategy? And Kavad's taking note. But he had done so at the cost of reigniting Iran's age-old rivalry with Rome. The Romans now openly broke their prior treaty obligations. Uh -oh. Both empires had previously agreed to stop building military fortifications on their shared border, as a hmm. gesture of good faith. But as soon as Kavad got distracted by Turkic tribes invading through the Caucasian gates, Anastasius bought every building in a small village called Dara and- Wow. Yeah, Dara's going to be an important border fort for a long time after this. Um, it's definitely going to pop up in the story again, I can tell you that much. Rapidly built it into a shoddy little fort. When Kavad turned back around and saw a fort where there had definitely not been a fort before, <laughs> he asked, Hey, did you put that fort there? And Anastasius answered, Hmm? That? No, 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 that's always been there. Here, take some gold. Go fight your Turks or whatever. Kavad <laughs> did have his hands full with the whole Turk situation and then beating up his former Hephthalite allies, so it mm. took him a while to get back to this Rome issue. By the time he finally did, things had changed. Anastasius had died without declaring an heir. An upstart pig farmer named Justin had stepped into his place, although... And we have some very important characters entering this story. Justin, who is an important emperor in his own right, but of course is mostly remembered for his successor, Justinian. Um, and honestly, because I know about Justin, Justinian, and the Byzantine Empire at this time, this is where my very light knowledge of Khosrow comes into play, because, you know, these two characters are involved with each other. We're going to see that interplay in future episodes. I'm excited to get to that. But this is some stuff that I do know, and because I know a bit about this stuff, I also know a little bit about the Sassanid Empire at this time. A little bit, but I'm learning a lot from these videos. So all reports indicated that his nephew Justinian was the real brains behind the throne. Yep. Still, it was a stark reminder to the aging Kavad that it was never too soon to choose an heir. The most obvious candidate was his eldest son, Kawus, who not mm. only had seniority, but currently served as a governor of a northern province. 
But Kawas was a fervent Mazdakite, and Kavad had spent years now trying to distance himself from that whole mess. Interesting. So, the Mazdakites were a religious sect who basically believed in radical egalitarianism, dividing the land equally, giving people food, and Kavad had associated with them, but had gotten himself into trouble with the aristocracy. And like they said, he's sort of been trying to distance himself from that religious sect, Though it makes sense that one of his sons would uh, be very into those ideas, given his past association. Yes. His second son had lost an eye, which technically disqualified him under Iranian rules of succession. Damn. And then there was Khosrow, his third son, his favorite. The one ah. who had already made allies at court by denouncing the Mazdakites. Not a hard choice, actually. <laughs> but the Mazdakites remained a problem. Even without Kavad's support, their goals of a classless society and equal distribution of wealth can... You know, very uh, proto-communist, right? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, classless society, equal distribution of wealth, that's basically exactly proto-communist. So it's sort of interesting. But, of course, you know, Marx doesn't have a monopoly on the ideas of a classless society or equal distribution of wealth. These are ideas that have existed probably throughout human history, and they pop up in a lot of places. But it's just interesting to uh, see them here. I'm also curious what sort of influence the Mazdakites have at this point, since the aristocracy definitely doesn't like them, and Kavad has tried to distance himself. I would assume it might be uh, popular amongst the people, which could be a problem. Continued to win converts across the empire. Right. They were still vastly outnumbered by followers of traditional Zoroastrianism, though, and a backlash eventually swelled against the Mazdakites and their radical ideas. Priests mm. pushed to enforce official doctrine all across the empire. And of course, one of the unique things about this, I mentioned how it kind of seems proto-communist, well, one of the differences is that, of course, you know, communism or Marxism is a political ideology, whereas the Mazdakites, this is a religious sect, so it directly comes into conflict with Zoroastrianism, which is the main religion of Iran at this point. It would be the main religion of Iran before uh, Islam, right? The Caliphate expanded into Iran, and then Islam would become the main religion of the region, but we're not there quite yet. And so Zoroastrianism is the main religion and the state religion. Even in the border territories, which Iran had traditionally allowed to do their own thing. For many of those territories, doing their own thing meant being Christian. So mm. having Zoroastrian doctrine suddenly enforced on them did not go over very well. It all came to a head in 524 CE when one Iranian territory with a Christian king decided to defect to Rome. Kavad. Ah, Iberia modern day Georgia. I always thought it was kind of strange that it has the name uh, Iberia. And of course, today we have the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain and Portugal. Uh, I'm curious if there's any relationship between those two names, Iberia, if they come from a common source or uh, I don't really know. But yeah, that is what we would today call Georgia. Reached out to Justin to see if they could resolve this peacefully. Justin, buddy, uh, hey, just a thought. Maybe stop accepting our runaway territories into your empire and let's just be friends, okay? <laughs> and hey, as a gesture of good faith to seal this friendship, I'll let you adopt Kozro as your son. The adoption offer was uh... mostly a formality. Kozro was a grown man. He wasn't exactly going to move to Constantinople and start calling Justin dad. <laughs> but the gesture could bring the two imp. Yeah, I mean, like they said, adoption was sort of an important institution in the ancient world. Um, my context for it is the Roman world, but it wasn't really what we think of uh, as adoption today. Like, you know, you adopt a child and then you raise them as your child. That, that's not really what it usually was. It was usually more a political thing. You know, it was a way of bringing a political ally or someone important into your family, a sign of respect, a sign of an alliance between the two empires together, and Roman support could help Khosrow claim the throne when Kavad died. In fact, the Iranians had done exactly this same thing for Rome in the 4th century, when a previous shah had adopted the emperor's son to secure his succession. Kavad mm. felt that it was high time Rome returned that favor. Justin loved this idea. His advisors did not love it as mm. much. They worried that this symbolic gesture might be the first step of a sneaky campaign to place Khosrow on the throne of the Roman Empire. Uh, they suggested maybe tone it down a little. 
So ambassadors from both sides met on the border, with Khosrow himself waiting in the wings. The wow. Romans said, great news, our emperor will adopt you, but not as a Roman and an equal son. And no, he's already got one uh -oh. of those. But he will adopt you as a barbarian, to which Khosrow <laughs> responded, he can adopt my fist to his face and went to war. Yeah, I can't imagine Khosrow would accept that offer. Of course, we have two mega empires here, and they both think they're the best, um, particularly the Romans. The Romans had a real ego. You know, we had Rome and everybody else, and everybody else were barbarians, right? But, you know, it's pretty clear, and even the Romans knew this, that the Persians were sort of a step above. I mean, they were, in many ways, an equal rival. This is why the rivalry lasted for so long. They were a lot more than the sort of common barbarians that the Romans uh, saw on all their other borders. And I'm using their language for that. That's how they refer to them, right? And so this move is a bit of a slap in the face, and I think even the Romans could have seen that coming. Like, it's not really an appropriate offer to Khosrow. The war started out great for Iran. Kicking the Romans up and down the frontier felt just like old times. By now, though, Justin had died and left the empire in the hands of his ambitious nephew, who began an aggressive push to fortify more places along the border. Here we have Justinian. Uh, I know Extra Series, or sorry, Extra History has a series on Justinian. Uh, I might consider doing that in the future. I would like to do more Justinian content. I mean, we did the series on Belisarius, uh, but I think Justinian is a very fascinating emperor. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, he is a major player in the story of Kosro, and we're already seeing that. The newly reinforced city of Dara, which Kavad always knew would be trouble, handed Iran their first major loss. In the peace negotiations that followed, Kavad insisted that the Romans pull down their fortifications at Dara and start <laughs> paying their fair share to defend the Caucasian gates. He did not live to hear Justinian's response. Mm. Kavad passed away in 531 CE, leaving a will that declared Khosrow should inherit his throne. The nobles quickly voted to confirm his choice, and at last, it was Khosrow's time to shine. All right, that is a fairly stable and peaceful succession, <laughs> particularly in a Persian or even a Roman context. They both had a lot of troubles with uh, these sort of things. But, as we saw earlier, Khosrow was already making friends at court, so he probably had a lot of aristocratic allies. You know, he was a legitimate heir, so it probably wasn't too difficult to confirm him as the next uh, Shah. But all the problems from his father's reign hit Khosrow at once. A uh -oh. new wave of invaders poured through the Caucasian gates, and the Iranian army was still tied up in the war with Rome. Khosrow called on his brother Kawus, who still governed a province up north, to repel the invaders. Kawus took care of the problem quickly, but then claimed that his victory proved that maybe he should be Shah <laughs> instead of Khosrow. Oh and man. Since Kawus I mean, this is exactly how it works. Even if you have a stable succession, a legitimate succession, if you have other people, say brothers or family members, who could also be seen as a legitimate heir, at least one of them is just going to go for it. This was a Mazdakite. Mazdak and his followers immediately joined his cause. Khosrow needed his army back, which meant he needed to make peace with Justinian and mm. recall the army from the borders of Rome. He invited Justinian's envoys into his court, but the envoys replied that they would not negotiate anything. Justinian had caught wind of Kawus's rebellion and hoped to sow as much chaos into Iran as he could. Yep, and as I mentioned before, this is exactly how it works. Um, I mean, if you have a rival, you want them to fight against their other enemies. You will also want to encourage internal division and chaos as much as possible. So, he refused to recognize Khosrow as the new Shah. Damn. Khaus came to Tessiphon to press his claim to the throne, and Khosrow watched his allies begin slipping away. Wow. Most nobles refused to recognize his brother, but a few quietly began to switch sides. The Mazdakites had given Khaus a strong base of support, and Khosrow decided that he needed to take that support away. Mm. He yep, I mean, we're seeing the Mazdakites were an issue for Kavad, even though he enabled them in the first place and now they're becoming a major issue for Khosrow. And this does show, you know, I mentioned last time, 
it's important to have support among your aristocrats and your people. So in this case, Khosrow, well, upon his ascension, he had support from the aristocrats. It might be a little shaky now, but he's losing the people because of this new ideology, this new religion that's spreading. You know, even if you're a king, you're a shah, you're an emperor, popular support is still pretty damn important because if you don't have it, one, it can lead to a popular uprising, or two, if someone else, like Kawush, your brother, has popular support, that gives him a lot more legitimacy. He invited Mazdak and his people to come to his palace without Kawus, promising to hear their demands. The invitation was a trap. As Damn. the Mazdakites entered his courtyard, Kosro had them cut down. One story, which is probably just a story, but it goes to show how ruthless Kosro was perceived to be, says mm. that he planted their corpses upside down in his <sighs> garden and invited Mazdak to gaze upon these unique and beautiful trees. Yeah, man, we get a lot of over-exaggerated stories from this time. They're probably right, that probably didn't exactly happen, but still a pretty brutal act from Khosro. Um, I mean, you can interpret that in many ways. Uh, this is sort of the beginning of his reign, so we don't yet know how it's going to turn out. This could be a sign of, you know, brutality, tyranny. It could be more a sign that, you know, he's someone who is willing to do what it takes to get stuff done. There's different interpretations. I, I think it's probably the latter, given what his reign will entail down the line, but you couldn't really tell that at this point. Then he had Mazdek hanged from the gallows. Jesus. Now that Kaus no longer- I mean, that is quite a way to bring a new religion or a popular ideology to an end. You bring its leader and his most devoted subjects to your palace, and you execute them. Well, like I said, that's certainly a way to do it. <laughs> Hunger had his most powerful ally. He was easy prey. Khosrow captured him and dragged him in front of the priests. He offered to set Kawus free if he begged forgiveness in front of all the holy men at court. Kawus replied that he preferred death to humiliation, and wow. Khosrow obliged. Then he hunted down every one of Kawus's sons and executed them before they could even think of avenging their father or stealing the throne. Now, I mean, this is extremely brutal, and it's pretty brutal even for this period. Now, like I said, if you have other people who can claim legitimacy to your throne, that's always a threat. But what is a little more common, at least uh, if I use the Roman Empire as a reference, which is what I know, you would often have potential heirs to the throne be become monks or perhaps disable them in some way. Um, just straight up execution that's a pretty brutal way to do it. So I would say even the standards of this period, Kosro is a pretty brutal ruler at this point. It was at this point that Kosro returned his attention to Justinian's envoys <laughs> and informed them that he was now, without question, the Shah of Iran. Would they like to make peace with him now? Damn. Justinian decided that, yes, he very much would. He handed over 11,000 pounds of gold to pay for the defense of the Caucasian gates and withdrew his military base from Dara. But mm. Kosro would not forget or forgive this Roman emperor <laughs> for failing to support his succession. Yep. Uh, I mean, Justinian is an important player in Kosro's story, and Kosro is an important player in Justinian's story two great emperors. It's kind of funny that their reigns occurred at the same time. They're two of the most important emperors for, you know, each of their empires, and their fates are, uh, their stories are intertwined in many ways. So I'm excited to see that as the series continues. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you could leave a comment, subscribe, leave a like, check out channel memberships, and the Patreon for exclusive reaction content. Anyway, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.